So welcome. We're still in a developer track, uh, and I'm going to talk about a bunch of stuff that is very much oriented around the time in your life when you go from you make your website to you and a, f a group of people band together and make someone else's website, usually for money. But there's a bunch of stuff that happens when you go from, you know, you're hacking away on your FTP and you're tweaking this change and it's all fine and it looks, you know, you're, you've made the change that you want. Once you start getting into a group of people and you're collaborating on something and you're trying to make uh, a code base that's stable and you're trying to make a site that you can, you know, you put it somewhere else and you want to let your client review a change before you go live, all the stuff that happens when you get to a, a kind of small team level, you have to review a bunch of stuff that you've been doing to, to make that jump, basically, to make it so that you can collaborate. So if the title of my talk is about process for small teams, that's not like, how do we meet every week to make sure that we're getting stuff done. It's not a pro like project management talk. Very much about what are the different types of things you have to do to set up the way you work to have your code be maintainable and collaboratable. That's my new word for today, collaboratable. <laughs> so uh, I've been doing web development, mostly web design development at, as a head of stress limit design for around 10 years, which is yeah, it's before WordPress. And we've been very happy to see WordPress as a project grow and take over and become stable and mature and most importantly, extensible. And so you can do the kinds of complicated custom stuff that we need to do with WordPress that's not just blogs and pages and that kind of thing. So some basic premise. Um, it's too bad, it's a beautiful pink color that doesn't come out so well on the screen. I like pink. Uh, some of the basic premise, you are working, you could be working alone. A lot of the stuff I'm gonna talk about I would suggest you do even if you're working alone, but especially once you get into a small team, uh, it, I'm assuming that you're, like I'm saying, you're doing custom development. Um, usually you're developing custom themes, mostly what we do. Uh, you are a coder or want to be a coder, and you do either the whole environment of all of these HTML, CSS, PHP, the other stuff we threw in there, SSH, SVN, these become more important as things that you more run into. Again, the larger you go, the farther you go along on the on the uh, on the train of like making your living doing this and building up teams and workflows and systems and everything. The other thing to be aware of: this is not uh, much like Jeremy was saying, introducing it by this is the way I do stuff. <laughs> this is not a scientific. This is the best way to do it. Um, scientific is my other invented word of the day. Uh, anecdotal evidence. I'm going to say like I like doing it this way. There's a million ways to do a lot of stuff I'm going to talk about. There's a, a million ways to do that thing, but this is the way that we do it and it works for us. So again, a lot of this is about setting up properly. It's architecting your themes in a way that you agree with. It's setting up uh, where you're going to do stuff and how you're going to do stuff, and that's you know a lot among your team. How you're going to collaborate on things. Uh, it's all about starting out properly, a strong foundation, so that um, the other premise is that you're building a site that you're going to want to maintain over years, and maybe other people are going to come into the project. There's all the kind of, think of things you have to think about that is different than uh, I'm going to start with my 2011, and if I don't like the thing over here, then I'm just going to tweak it in, in the theme, or, or even just quickly making a child theme, like uh, we had a talk earlier today, it was great about child theming. Um, even that, we have to go a step further, setting things up properly so that they're maintainable. So in talking about setup, Basic things, you're gonna have a development environment because you're not gonna wanna do, uh, you know, if it's just your website, you probably assume no one's looking at it when you're making that change and you know, you're gonna send someone to the link next week, it's fine, it's fixed then. Of course, when you're doing stuff for 
in, in bigger teams for bigger, bigger clients and more visible projects. You need a development environment. Often there's a staging or you know, approval environment that you have clients look at. And then, of course, there's production stuff. I'm going to talk very quickly about hosting because even though this is, again, a huge discussion, there's a million places to do it, but I'll just, you know, again, anecdotally tell you a few that we use. Version control, this is a really big, very fundamental thing that is often the most visible thing that happens in a difference between when you're making a quick site for yourself or your uncle and when you start doing stuff commercially, especially in Teams. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about plugins. Um, and then a bit about code organization, how you organize your theme. Again, million solutions. It's mostly about how you and your team decide to do stuff, but I'll show you some suggestions. So getting to those environments, development environment. Uh, we often will develop locally on our own computers now, um, which is great. You have things like MAMP and WAMP, which let you set up and run WordPress and other sites on your home computer. Um, uh, sometimes we'll do stuff where we set up a dev domain somewhere else and we know that that person is working on that domain and in, in, it avoids setting up a local environment and duplicating the production database and doing all some other complicated things that, uh, that it's easier sometimes to just set something up somewhere and like that's where we work on that site. Um, staging environment is optional. If we have a small, medium site, often it's almost not worth setting up a staging environment because you can just look at, I mean, you can already point someone over here, does it look good? Great, make it live. Uh, and then production, quick talk, um, Bluehost we use for a lot of stuff, Dreamhost. Neither of these do well for high or even medium traffic stuff. So again, there's a million solutions. I'm sure everyone has a bunch of ideas. I just like these ones. Media Temple's DV product is pretty good and pretty scalable. You can, you know, you can really add in RAM, and it, it, it works pretty well for t small, medium traffic sites. Their grid server uh, sucks. So then when you choose a production environment, of course, you need the basics of WordPress, Linux, Apache, PHP, MySQL. SSH I like. I like it a lot. Um, for our sync is amazing. For example, you have a production server, you go like, uh, but you get a client over here, input all of your 50 million images and videos and content and everything, and then will you have them all over here and you eventually need them get to the production and environment. If you have SSH access, you can do stuff like our sync. And then of course you can run SVN. That goes back to the version control thing. Uh, some of the talks that I've seen, are, I get the idea that not people, not everyone uses SVN or version control or Git or that kind of thing. Uh, how many people here develop and code and do some of this stuff but do not use Git or SVN or anything? Is there anyone? And we got a couple sheepish hands. That's all right. Um, so the SSH thing cancels. I'll get further into the SVN Git thing in a minute. The SSH factor means it cancels out most cloud hosting stuff, so like Raspberry Cloud sites, a bunch of these things that seem really great. If I can't SSH in and do stuff, then it's, I don't, I don't like, I don't like, I don't like. Um, the biggest thing, again, when I'm talking about this jump of from you're personally developing something to you're doing it in Teams, it's about portability. This is my, uh, that's what my laptop looks like. Um, it's about portability. You want so that you, you're five or 10 or two, teammates, you're developing something and you're looking at the same thing. You know that uh, the tweak that you're making here is going to make the same change over for your friend and on the staging and on the production ultimately. And we have the same setup. So a lot of the thing that you have to think about that you don't have to think about if you're just FTPing into your live server and changing it is how do we make a setup that's repeatable and easily deployable? There's complicated stuff you can get into you know, virtual machines. Uh, I find it's a little bit overcomplicated because we just have a good, simple, nice setup that's repeatable. It's very easy to do. Um, and it's also based on the premise that code is portable because ideally we're going to convert those people who just put their hands up so that they're going to be using SVN and Git or whatever. That kind of stuff is, is, is versioned and it's locked and it's very clear and it doesn't change. The database is much less portable, so if someone's made some dummy content over here uh, or if you've uploaded an image and it's put the full server or dev domain into the database, more stuff you have in the database, 
the more volatile it is, and it's harder to just go in and look at it. So all the stuff we want to do, as much as possible, do it with, with code. Um, and it's about control. I didn't, I didn't see this movie, actually, but I like Joy Division, so it, and it worked for the slide. Um, and we want to be able to control stuff. Version control. We need to version things. Part of it is about tracking and managing things. Uh, for those of you have heard the idea but don't haven't used it, or you know SVN or Git, especially SVN, I like to think of it as kind of the platonic ideal of what your code ideal you know should be in this uh, celestial version, and then all of the instances are just looking back and you know to this to this perfect version of the correct version of what the code is. You can make a change, and if it's right, you, you, know, you push it up so that, that becomes part of the model of what your code is. But uh, there's definitely somewhere out there centrally that's telling everyone what the code should be. It also lets you blame people. There's a positive and negative connotation to blame. But who did what when, and who broke it, and who fixed it, and all that kind of stuff is good. We even use version control for deployment. Uh, and I'll get to that. There's a number of aspects to that, but it's about um, do you want to take your theme into production by dragging it into the FTP and have it, you know, thinking for a while and then maybe futzing up as it's doing it and then something breaks. No, you, a version control, a Git SVN, you can use it to actually to, to deploy to production, make it more stable. Um, and again, it's about keeping multiple instances of what you're doing in sync. So everyone's working on the same thing. You're adding to the same uh, collective ideal of the, you know, the forward progress of the development of your site. And it, even for backup of what you're doing, if you have somewhere that you have a repository of your code, uh, this should be backed up. And if the production server goes down, you don't care because you have it somewhere that you can easily deploy it to another place. Um, a couple specific places that we use or have used to do this stuff. Uh, Beanstalk I like because you can do Git, you can do SVN, you can do Mer Mercurial. If there's anyone who uses Merc Mercurial, I doubt it. Um, and it does something neat, which is a actual FTP deploy of your versioned code, so that if you have, you know, you're not always in total control of what the final production environment is going to be. If people don't support um, SVN or Git or any kind of version control on their production, you can push it up there automatically, and you still don't have the margin of error is if you're dragging something manually from FTP. Self-hosted SVN, we have a SVN, no stress limit design. And then there's GitHub, I love GitHub. It's a beautiful platform. It's the reason that you've heard of Git today. Um, and it's, there's really neat things you can do with GitHub, although there are annoying things about Git. Let me look at this for a second. I'm gonna say something very controversial right now. I don't really like Git. I know it's very cool, and it's very now and everything, but I find, working with it very awkward, but I do it because GitHub is so awesome. And then why are these two things, why do they exist? How do you choose one or the other? Um, SVN is completely centralized. There is a home hub. This is the repository. This is controlling. This is the right version. And everyone's committing and pulling from this centralized place which is also good for controlled account access that I can give the six or two people that I need to be able to pull and push to that repository access. Um, it's easy to track and branch and tag and stuff. WordPress itself uses SVN, of course. Um, and little thing that I like to be able to commit stuff and then pull just like one file. I know I made one change. I wanted to just pull that file. You can't do that with Git. It's like all or nothing. Uh, I like, I like SVN. Um, and it's good for, this is the most important point, uh, it's also good for controlled production because you know there's kind of single point of entry. You, it, it's just easier to lock down, I find, and it's easier to do lots of pushing and pulling and merging, and it somehow merges better. Git messes up when you're merging stuff. Or I don't know, I don't like Git. Git, uh, totally non-centralized. Every copy of the repository of Git actually is cloned, and it is or can become the central authoritative repository of that thing, which is cool. Like, socio-politically, that sounds really cool to me. <laughs> but like, <laughs> and, you know, in code, there is a right version and there is a wrong version, and I like to be able to know which one is which. Uh, it also has easily branch and actually easier branching and stashing and merging. I hate working with it, but that's you know another story. Uh, and the cool thing about it, the main thing that makes it better 
for the thing that it's supposed to be doing is that you can have user more complicated user access without just being like, yes, you can read and write and do everything, and no, you can't do anything, which is part of the reason that GitHub is so amazing is that you can fork a project, change it, and then go, uh, you know, uh, send a pull request that your change get pulled back into that project. If not in SVN, if you don't want to, you know, you're collaborating a project, you want someone to be able to change something, you're like emailing around patch files and stuff, it's super weird and really awkward for open source stuff. I, like I said, maybe, I know like so much. Except uh, GitHub is awesome, and this thing about forking and pull requests really give you a power that you can't have with SVN, which is collaborating. Someone sends you a pull request, you look at it, you're like, oh well, this total stranger made a really neat change to my open source plugin, and I can just kind of commit it without thinking about whether do I give this person commit access or do I ask them now to email me a patch file and stuff. It's very, really, really great for open source projects uh, as the main, that, that's the kind of the main advantage for me. It's really, it's, it's really good for that kind of thing. Um, we have a bit of a weird thing where we do some open source stuff that's on GitHub and on the WordPress plugin repository, which is a bit awkward, but we don't really have a good solution for it because we like working on GitHub. And then it eventually you have to push onto the re, you know the pro public plugin repo on WordPress. We don't. It's just duplicated. I don't know how to get out of it. Um, WordPress though uses SVN. I like SVN. Did I mention that? It's good. Um, the best way to do well, just dive into some total techy geekery here. You've probably done this. You go to WordPress.org and press download, and you get the zip, and then you unzip it on your computer, and then you upload it up to a FTP site of where your server, this is just to get WordPress installed, and then you wait for like 20, I don't know, however long, because there's 50 million files. Probably breaks in the upload. Uh, very simple, awesome thing you can do and feel very, you know, like you're hacking the mainframe is uh, SSH into your server. If your server has SVN on it, hopefully, and just run, can we see the yellow and black? as we can. Uh, run SVN, check out the core WordPress, then the proper tag, and the dot is the current directory. Oh yeah, do we dim the lights here? Nice. Uh, and then we get all this magic like of 50 million files just suddenly appear in your directory and you suddenly have WordPress installed in like 16 seconds instead of 15 minutes or whatever. Um, it keeps going forever and ever. And then we have like fetching external item. What's that? We'll get to that in a second. You checked out the revision of, uh, of WordPress. It's fun and exciting. Um, and then that's also the best way to update WordPress. It happens way less now, but I used to always be like, okay, I need a new version. You press update and then it's like ask for your password and you, it's wrong or, and then it just, you're updating and then it's broken and then you have to, it's, anyway, it's a pain. To update, you just SSH in and again, SVN switch, that's what the W is, and then once they do 3.5, you'll just go run this command and it'll brrr, update everything, it's magic and it's great. Very simple, nice, you should always be doing this for every site, it's gonna save you so much time over your life. If you're developing in WordPress, you're gonna install WordPress 50,000 times in your life, picture that. If you saved two minutes for every time. Going back to this thing where it said, where'd we go? Not that far. Where it said, uh, uh, this one, fetching external item into plugins. WordPress does this thing with their Akismet project. It's somewhere else, but somehow it's pulled into WordPress when you check it out. You too can do this really cool geeky thing. Uh, by tracking externals. So the other thing about portability, very important, you have a site, you have a theme, you're tracking your theme somewhere on GitHub or your own SVN or Codebase HQ or Beanstalk or wherever you're doing it, you check out your theme and then you load the site and you have a blank page, it just totally doesn't work or just ex errors exploding everywhere and you don't know why, it's because you need 20 plugins on this site to make it work and you don't have any of them. And then so you can either go, you look over, the, you have the list of plugins over here, can I get this one, okay, add new plugin, is that the install now? And did, did you've probably done this if you've ever tried to make your site somewhere else so you can figure out what's wrong or you can fix a design. Uh, super important to do this, uh, tracking externals, SVN prop edit externals. 
and SVN does this a lot better than Git, actually, by the way. Uh, this is the dot as if we're in this uh, folder, or we could have done just SVN externals with the path. And it gives you a little file like this if you're using like VI. Right now in WordPress, it has a Kismet. This folder, which is cut off on the display called a Kismet, tracks from a repo, which is here at this other URL, also at the plugins repository. That's how we got the fetching external item. So we like updated, checked out, or updated WordPress, and it automatically got WordPress over here, and then it obviously went over to this other place and grabbed this other plugin, and everything's perfect. You can do that too if you go to insert, like you change this file and write a bunch of stuff in here. And so, for example, there's other plugins, co-authors plus, or simple page order, editorial calendar. Um, we use a thing called StressPress, which I'll get to in a minute, which is just kind of, you know, just to toolkit stuff. This is your list of the plugins that you need, and it's the best way to actually version the dependency of this site. If you have five or ten, whatever, hopefully closer to five than 20 plugins to run your site, you need to have somewhere that you're tracking this. And the best way to do it is if you have all of most, all or most of the plugins are in uh, SVN or Git or somewhere, you can automate the checking of those plugins and check them out and automate updating of them by using this SVN externals. Super useful. Um, and then when you uh, save that file and exit, it'll go set new value for property XVN externals on plugins. You can run SVN up, and it will again magically for all of for each of the lines that you put in that externals file, go get that plugin and put it here. Go get that plugin and put it here. Go get that plugin and put it here. Again, all towards the goal of that we have code text files that are. Uh, running the setup of our site rather than there's an untracked and unknown list of plugins in this folder and then which ones are active or lost in a database somewhere that we, you know, we don't want to get into. It's a good way to centralize and version the managing those plugins. You can even put in your theme a text file that says you know, externals.txt or whatever and have it just have the text of this so that you know when you're going to go to, you know, again, it's a bit about you got to work out your process with your team. But if you know that you have an external TXT in your theme, when you're checking it out for the first time, especially if you have a new team member, part of your goal is like you want that person up and running and coding and helping you in five minutes, not five hours, wherever they're going to be developing. So if you know the process, okay, you check in the externals.txt file, copy and paste that into your thing and update, and then it will automatically get all of your plugins that you need then you don't care what's in your database. You know in the code, you have your theme here, you have the plugin dependencies here, and you just have to activate them and everything should work and all the million errors on the front of your page should go away. Um, so that's really useful. A lot of people don't know about that, but it's super, super, especially if you have like, again, when you make the jump from you're doing this in a team uh, alone to you're doing it in a team, probably, uh, the one of the things that you're starting to do is build more sites, which is, you know, hopefully it's going to pay for you all and stuff. The more sites you build, like you need a toolkit, and you need a working flow. If you have the, usually the same handful of plugins, like we have, you know, four or six plugins that we use in a lot of projects because they give a couple of core functionality. Either we're building these plugins and these are our toolkits, which I'm going to, you know, share some of that today, or just stuff that you use all the time. There's a simple page ordering plugin that's really good that just lets you add the drag and drop capability to the pages and custom content types. It's really useful. We use it in a lot of stuff and we worked with the people who made it on, uh, on unrelated stuff. But uh, we have that in our like common SVN externals file. So very useful. Uh, I'm going to get a little bit into the idea of you're developing with your team you're going to work out your workflow and process stuff, but you're also going to work out your toolkit. So if you're, you, uh, I'm also very much in agreement with an earlier talk that we heard late, late this morning that's about, yes, there's complicated theme frameworks out there, and you can uh, either start from 2011 and extend it, or, or a bunch of people have worked out complicated theme frameworks, like the Woo frameworks and this kind of stuff. I find more that they try and give you interfaces to manage mass amount of design and layout and functionality stuff 
first of all, the more that information gets stored in a database, so the easier it is to lose, because nobody likes schlepping around databases from server to server. It's just like a recipe for disaster. Um, but also, less of it is trackable. You know, less, less of it is trackable in the code, and less of it you have more bloat that's around the interface that allows you to manage that thing. You know, that ten times the size of just the functionality itself. So we like to have basic starter themes. Of course, in the bottom of a theme, all, there, all you need is a style sheet. Um, but then pretty soon you're going to find you have your own basic, well, these are the five things that I start with or whatever. We have sites that have only the, that's the theme, just that's it. Because it's super simple, well, there'll probably be an images folder, but um, that's, that's it. That's all you need. We need a style sheet that tells you some stuff. We need the header and the footer, the index and a single. That's about it. Mostly, a lot of sites, especially if you're doing like small corporate sites, if it's more about design, uh, in quick implementing a WordPress and getting it done, then you can do a real quick, you know, get in, get out, and the theme is easy, and the people are happy because it's their like five page corporate sites. Yes, it tells about my bakery or whatever. Um, and then it's super easy to maintain. You know when you go back to it in six months, you know when you send, you know, when you've scaled up and you hired 10 people and you send one of your people to go fix something, it's going to be clear. It's, and it becomes more and more important, the more that you work in teams and the more that you work on more volumes of sites, having a clear, this is how we do stuff process is more important than having, this is a really awesome, fancy, powerful, uh, finicky framework interface that does this stuff for you. So probably in the themes, you're maybe going to add a 404. Maybe the pages are different. Maybe you have a sidebar, uh, comments and stuff. Probably going to have images, JavaScript. Well, now this is getting, this isn't as simple anymore. Let me think about this. Uh, often the include file is the powerful place. So over time, good chance you're going to be like, as everything, now that I've done this five times, how do I make it easier to do the sixth time and the tenth time? Uh, we've, you know, just from over time, have an evolving starter theme which has just some of this basic stuff. It's basically empty. Maybe the style sheet has like an HTML reset and a few basic typography stuff just to get font sizes in place. And then you're going to start doing custom stuff. Um, very happy to have you guys go there to the, again, to the GitHub. I don't like Git, but it's fine. Um, Go there and check it out. If it's useful, great. Uh, it has just some very simple setup stuff. For example, you're going to have, look, this is our functions file. We know it's always going to look like this. Uh, we have some includes at the top. We're going to have an init that just does like setting up the style sheet or whatever. Why do we include the style sheet? This is like parenthesis. Why am I including all, and queuing all of this stuff instead of just putting it in the header? For example, you're going to work out in your team. You're like, don't put the style sheet in the header. Put it in on queue script and then WP head includes it in the header. Well, because then if you're going to use a caching plugin, then you know, like total cache will grab them all and compile them and CDN them and all that kind of stuff. Just stuff like that. It's like, over time you're going to find, yes, there's five ways to do that, but if we do it this way, it's going to, we're going to know where it is and we're going to have the other advantages that come from that kind of stuff. And our team knows where to go when we add, well, we have another JavaScript we want to add or whatever. Well, then you know to go to functions because that's where the JavaScript and style sheet stuff is. It's worth doing that kind of stuff and so that everyone on your team knows where that stuff is and knows how you've set it up and knows how you're doing it. Um, you'll notice that there's a mystery function in here called is login page. That's not part of WordPress. Um, and it's a weird thing. If you go, I'll get to that in a second, but if you go is admin, it, it's false when you're on the login page. So if you include your style sheet, somehow you're you expect the login page to look like WordPress, but it has like a big black background or whatever. It's because there's no login page. So then I'm getting to stuff that, well, what are our building blocks? Again, anecdotal evidence, there's 50 million ways to do this. Here's some useful stuff that's from the way that we do it. Um, we have a thing called stress press, which does like the is login page thing that I mentioned so that we know that don't include the style sheet and the you know, JavaScript and all the stuff specific to the theme on the login page. Something simple. We realized we did it three times. I just make a little function to do that. Um, we do you know, basic setup functionality stuff. Uh, we remove a bunch of the core dashboard clutter. No offense to the WordPress project, but some of it is clutter. My client doesn't need to know what's their new popular plugins. Um, the admin menu items, you always get into this kind of stuff, and we have 
just a starter file that has removing everything, but they're all commented out. So we put it in there and we like uncomment the three pages that this client doesn't need to see, and we leave the three that this client does or whatever. Um, I find in a lot of themes we get it, we used to get into, or you've seen other stuff where it's like this variable equals get post meta this key, this variable equals get post meta this key, and if you have a bunch of you know, extra custom fields, that list can get really long, so we have a function just like post meta all that just gives you back the post object but with all of the other custom fields as part of the object. It's like further object orienting, almost doing the like lazy loading dependencies that other MVC frameworks do. Uh, you can put admin branding and stuff. So this is our like just basic toolkit. There's almost no reason to make this into a plugin because there's a lot of stuff specific to the way that we do stuff. You guys, again, the more that you work in the same team and you develop the same kinds of workflow stuff, you're going to find a place or a system that you guys have of stashing useful stuff that you put everywhere. I like actually GIST, GitHub has the, just a real quick thing called GIST. So we have like our common HT access. Yeah, WordPress gives you one, but we have one that's you know kind of three times as long. It has a bunch of other stuff like anti uh, cross site scripting things or better uh, character set defaults or just stuff that you put in HTAccess. access. Put it as a gist. Everyone knows where to go and get it when they make a new WordPress because you need an HTAccess access file. A bunch of that kind of stuff. You're going to figure out where, what you do with that. The other, now I'm getting into really architect. What do we do when we make a WordPress site now? Very rarely is a website three pages and a blog. There's always, at this point, there's always something. There's always like, oh, and we want to talk about, I don't know, we want to talk about, we want to put a bunch of videos and have a whole separate page for videos and it do with this totally other thing. So it's really not a post at this point with the video category. It's really this other thing. Or we want to put recipes and then another place where you browse and search recipes and do this other stuff. Um, so of course, I'm talking about custom content types. Then we've, uh, got a plugin that wraps the register post type. It's less and less useful over the years. Thankfully, what happened when, when 3.1 came out and they have the uh, API to register custom post types, there's a lot of stuff that didn't get in the first release of, for example, making an archive page. So when you go to slash videos, you see the list of videos. So we had to put that into the plugin and thankfully, well, that's now part of core, so we got to take that out of the plugin. Cool, this plugin hopefully should just get edited down to nothing. Um, same with taxonomies. Mostly what it helps us do is just good defaults. You know, you make a custom post type, that's what the code to make a book post type is. That seems like a pain. Why do we have to define all these label stuff? So our plugin just gives you good defaults and makes it so you can just go register post type book. Okay, great, it takes you two seconds instead of 10 minutes. Every 10 minutes you can save over your life you'll get a year at the end of your, I don't know. I'm sure somebody did a calculation on that. Um, the other thing that we do always, custom fields on stuff. There's plugins to do all of these things. There's a good trio of simple types and simple fields and simple taxonomies. But again, all your stuff then is in your database so that somebody on one of your dev servers or on their computer, you know, they, they set this stuff up and they made all the custom types and fields and stuff that you wanted, but then that doesn't help you because you didn't, how can you look at the videos when the declaration of the video post type is in their database? And then again, you're going to slap around databases, you don't want to do that. If you put it into code, great. This is a plugin that was first uh, mostly started by Mo Jangda, who's somewhere. I didn't see him today, but he was supposed to be here. He had to go home. Okay, bye, Mo. Uh, and then uh, Joey and uh, the other people at the Stress Limit team have taken it up, and it's about to get an awesome update, actually. Um, yay for update. It's about making custom fields really easy, one-line code thing. So you're going to go, um, you have, whether it's a, an existing type or a uh, new type that you've created, you want to define then, well, what does a video have? What does this thing have? Uh, it's a really simple code base, like add a meta group. Um, for example, this is from a real estate site or whatever, so we, we want to have the address. You can make select boxes. You can have other uh, text, edit, text area editors. This kind of stuff, super easy, but you need to be able to do it, and you need to be able to do it repeatably, and you need to be able to do it versioned and portably so the rest of your team sees the same thing when they're trying to fix stuff. We're going to get an update so that 
we have uh, actually using the Twitter bootstrap thing because it's a pretty nice little interface of groups of fields. Often you want like a name and a URL and you want to be able to have many of those things and you want to be able to order them. That's the kind of thing you can do. Uh, the other thing that we see here is a screenshot where it says project team. This is actually a relation to users. So we want to be able to multi-select which users are associated with this project. That's the kind of thing that multiplies the power of WordPress. So when you're looking at uh, a, a project, you see the different people relating to it, but you didn't need to like duplicate that information of who those people were between the users and the project that you're looking at. So again, it's about custom relations. There's a really powerful plugin that we've used that's not developed by us that's uh, post to post which is actually written and maintained by a core uh, WordPress guy, Scribu. And it's, it's really, really great. Um, and it lets you do stuff like register, for example, my recipe. You have a recipe, you have many ingredients, you want to relate many ingredients to the recipe. So you have a pork chops and you want to say that in the pork chops recipe you need pork chops and you need salt and you whatever else. You can define that relation, but then also metadata on that relation, which is cool. So you can say, I need four pork chops, one inch thick boneless loin pork chops, and then you can, this is the example of where you can really go nuts with WordPress as a data development framework, not as a CMS, well, both I guess, um, that you can have the relation between the ingredient and the recipe, but also metadata on that relation, which is really useful so that you can pull this recipe out so I can use black pepper in as many recipes as I want, but I know at a different amount in the different relation to my other recipe. Wow. So what is this about? Again, it's about making a small team. How do you support that team? You can make enough stuff and enough sites and apps of different sizes that can support your team and that your team has a toolbox that you know how to work with and you work well together. So it's now we can define generic content objects. We have not just post pages, videos, whatever, all that stuff. And all those things have inherent CMS uh, properties, you can edit them, you have users, permissions, and templates, and display, and we have all this stuff to create and manage those objects, and we can define custom attributes on those objects that a video has a title and a YouTube URL and whatever else we need, um, and also define complex relations between those objects. We can kind of do anything, that's kind of all the internet is, is, you know, the definitions of object, and stuff you can do with Rails and, you know, other, uh, these kind of more complicated custom frameworks and Django and that kind of stuff, except we do it all in WordPress and it, the, it's an interface that's standardized and everyone in every, no matter, almost at this point, no matter how deep in some kind of weird corporate echelon on IE5 or whatever, they know WordPress and they're comfortable with the interface. Which is, you know, we do a lot of selling to large companies and Fortune 500 people and they're like, they don't get simplicity and they don't get just doing it nicely, but they get WordPress and they're like, oh cool, I can just do that, great. So WordPress as a web development framework, you need a process that your team can manage and a way that you can work together in your toolkit. Um, and again, yeah, it can get so that it's a framework that can power sites that need teams actually. You can have large enough things that will support your, I like, I like, I like WordPress. Fun stuff. Um, then we have a bit of time for questions. I plowed through just a lot of stuff. Uh, Pick something out of that, anything that's useful. If you get one little tidbit out of this, great. If you're like, this revolutionized the way that you can think about developing, great. Either way, uh, thanks, my question. Yeah.